This evening our text is in Acts chapter 17, so if you would like to follow along in the reading, you turn to Acts 17. We're going to be looking at two verses in particular, verses 24 and 25, and I'm going to read a little bit of the larger context. Beginning in verse 16 through verse 34, this is uh, Paul at Athens on uh, Mars Hill, and um, the... uh, course, the sermon he preaches to the philosophers there regarding who it is that they really are indebted to, who is the true God, and that is, of course, the God of Jacob that we've just been singing about, and the one that we trust, the triune God. Acts chapter 17, beginning in verse 16. Now, while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was being provoked within him as he was beholding the city full of idols. So he was reasoning in the synagogue with the Jews and the God-fearing Gentiles and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be present. And also some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers were conversing with him and some were saying, what would this idle babbler wish to say? Others, he seems to be a proclaimer of strange deities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new teaching is, which you are proclaiming? For you are bringing some strange things to our ears. We want to know, therefore, what these things mean. Now all the Athenians and the strangers visiting there used to spend their time in nothing other than telling or hearing something new. And Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens... I observe that you are very religious in all respects. For while I was passing through and examining the objects of your worship, I also found an altar with this inscription to an unknown God. What therefore you worship in ignorance, this I proclaim to you, the God who made the world and all things in it. Since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands. Neither is he served by human hands as though he needed anything since he himself gives to all life and breath and all things. And he made from one every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their habitation that they should seek God if perhaps they might grope for him and find him though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and exist, even as some of your own poets have said, for we also are his offspring. Being then the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and thought of man. Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now declaring to men that all everywhere should repent because he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. Now when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some began to sneer, but others said, we shall hear you again concerning this. So Paul went out of their midst. But some men joined him and believed, among whom also was Dionysius the Areopagite and a woman named Damaris and others with them. May the Lord bless his word to our understanding this evening. Now again, we, as I've already mentioned, we have been looking at why it is we should love God And certainly, we already know, I don't think we need any study on this point, that we should love God for the things that he has given to us. I think um, we all feel some affection for those who do kind things for us. Well, certainly, God is one who has done a great deal of kind things for us and takes care of us. And again, everything we have, we owe to him. But we've also been looking at the fact that we should love God for who he is and what he is. In other words, that we should love not only the gift and the giver for the gift, but we should love the giver of the gift. I hope that makes sense. Sometimes our love for God may not go any further than simply uh, being appreciative for what he has given to us. 
It needs to go beyond that. We need to love the one who gives. We need to love the giver. We need to love God himself. Now, by this time, I hope we're beginning to see, if we haven't already forgotten what we've seen, that God is actually very easy to love. I mean, it's hard not to love someone who is love itself, who is infinite love, one who is patient, one who is kind, who is merciful to, to us, to well, over having well, provided a sacrifice for our sins, willing to overlook those things. One who is so gracious and knowing that he is that way, it's not really hard to love one who also has the other attributes we've been looking at, that of infinite power, infinite, as it were, existence. He's always been infinite knowledge. He knows everything that has been and ever will be. And infinite presence, that God is everywhere at once. I mean, God is here and he sees us and he sees what's in our hearts and he knows what we're doing and why we're doing it. It's not hard to love a being like this, at least it's not hard to do that, if you are a believer. We know the Bible tells us, and we see that everywhere around us, that there are unbelievers who don't love God. And it's not just because they don't understand who he is, it's because they do understand who he is. And it's not within their hearts to love such a being, because their hearts are hard. Because they love sin, they love darkness. I mean, Jesus said that the light, you know, this is the judgment. Lights come into the world. But men love darkness rather than light. They love ignorance rather than truth. They love sin rather than righteousness, and so they do not come to the light. They hate God's light. They hate his holiness, his infinite love for everything that is good and right. The very reason why we love him is the reason why they hate him. And of course, only the Spirit of God can remove that blindness and help them to see what really makes God beautiful, and that is his holiness. Now again, we've already seen that, and if we are Christians, if we are true Christians, it's because God, by his Holy Spirit, has opened our eyes to be able to see that that holiness really is something that is attractive and desirable. Our hearts incline towards that. That's what we want because it's our nature to want that because we have a new nature that has been produced by the Holy Spirit. So we are aware of that. But being aware of that, we do need to be aware that there are other reasons why we ought to love the Lord. And tonight we're going to look at another reason, and that is because he is the ultimate source of all good and the only possible source for all these things and the only eternal and infinite source of all these things. Now again, I said we had two attributes left to look at in this series, two more reasons why we should love the Lord. The first one is because he doesn't need anything. That's the one we're going to look at tonight. The second one we're going to look at, Lord willing, next week is because he never changes. And I hope you can see just on the surface, those are great reasons to love this God who has loved us with an infinite love. Now tonight we're going to consider the first and we're going to see two things. First of all, God has everything that he needs in himself. And second, because he does, he can continue to give to us everything that he has promised for all eternity. And really, when you stop and think about just your own well-being, you can see that that is absolutely necessary for any kind of security. Now, first of all, let's consider that God has everything that he needs within himself. Paul says in our text this evening that he doesn't dwell in temples made with hands, doesn't need a house, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything. God, as a matter of fact, doesn't need anything. He doesn't need our worship. He doesn't need anything at all. Now, what that means is that God is quite a bit different than you and me. He doesn't need anything, but we, of course, need everything. And it's good to see, I mean, it's helpful to see uh, what God is like by contrasting him with, with those that are unlike him, and that is us. I mean, for us, if we are to go on living if we're to go on existing, we need certain things. We need shelter from the elements. 
you know it can get too hot and we can die because of the heat. It can get too cold. We can die because it's too cold. We need shelter. We also need food in order to survive. I was trying to find some t statistics on how long you can survive without food and of course it varies from individual to individual. But I think around 40 days, uh, give or take a little bit, is about how long we can survive. Without food after that, well, we just can't make it. With regard to water, you know, if we're in the desert, we'll last maybe a day or maybe three days. If, if we're in a hospital bed somewhere, we might last for 14 days, but not very long without water. And what about air? That's something that we need even more than these other things. We can only make it a few minutes without air before we lose consciousness. Only about 10 minutes without air before we begin to suffer brain damage. And it's not long after that, if the brain dies, then you die and I die. We wouldn't even make it that long if the Lord should withdraw that which we need moment by moment just to exist. You need to realize that you don't exist in and of yourself. You are not independent. God is the one who upholds you in being, even as he does everything else that we see, all the, the rest of the material universe and the spiritual realm as well. Everything aside from God depends upon God from moment to moment for its existence. If God stopped to upholding it, stopped exerting his power to keep these things existing, they would simply cease to exist. We would fall into nothingness. We need his hand every moment to hold us up. Now we do know that it's true that when we die, that we're not going to cease to live or to exist, we are going to go on existing forever in one of two places, either heaven or hell, depending upon whether or not we've trusted Jesus and turned from our sins. But that's only because God is holding us up. I mean, God continues to uphold the, the, the spirits of righteous men in heaven, and he continues to uphold the existence of the damned souls in hell. Everything is sustained by the Lord. If he didn't exert that power, we wouldn't exist. So again, the point is, we are utterly dependent upon God for our existence and for our continued survival from moment to moment. But God isn't like this. God doesn't depend on anything. He doesn't need anything. He doesn't need shelter. He doesn't need food or water or air. He doesn't depend on anything to hold him up in his being. He doesn't depend on anything or anyone for his existence. God, unlike everything else, has everything that he needs in himself. And that's what we mean by the fact that God is independent and God is self-existent. We are not self-existent. We are existing only because of God. He has the reason for his existence within himself. So you and I are created, but God is uncreated. Nothing caused him. He caused us, but nothing caused him. He's always been, and he always will be. We need the Lord's power to maintain our existence, but he has the power to maintain his own existence, and he has always had that power. And the interesting thing is, as much power as the Lord may have exerted to create the universe with a word, it hasn't decreased his power in the slightest. It neither increases nor decreases because it is always infinite, because he is infinite. So basically, he never has and never will need anything. Boy, talk about security. <laughs> That's absolute security, a being who has everything that he needs. Now, I've already uh, sort of given a prelude to this, but I thought I'd bring it up, uh, the question that has come up in the history of the church, whether or not really God does need anything, whether God created the world, for instance, in order to meet a need that he had within himself, whether he created an audience, uh, you and me, because he needed to reveal his glory whether he needed to allow the fall to take place so that he could redeem a people to himself because he needed to redeem fallen creatures or that he redeemed us because he needs someone to worship him. 
Well, does God need these things? Did God do these things because he had some kind of a need? Well, the answer to that question is no. Again, if you understand the fact that God is independent, that means he doesn't need anything. You need to realize that the only ones that benefit from what the Lord has done in this, this whole creation and the work of redemption is us. We're the only ones that really benefit from it. Maybe the angels too, the holy angels benefit from it. We're the ones that receive existence when we didn't have existence before. We are the ones who receive life. We are the ones who have received eternal life, who didn't deserve any of these things. But those things don't benefit God in any way. God, it has been said, is like a full bucket that nothing can be added to because he's already full. He has all the power he needs, infinite power. God has all the fellowship that he needs. He didn't need us for companionship. I mean, he has the three persons of the triune God. He's had fellowship throughout eternity. He is eternally three persons. And he didn't need us to complete his happiness because God is absolutely as happy as he could be. He is infinite blessedness in and of himself. God has everything and he doesn't need us. So why did God make us? He made us purely for his good pleasure. He made us out of his superabundant fullness, it has been said, because God is so good. He just chose to create beings that he might show all of his goodness. Now the same is true with regard to Jesus, at least with regard to his divine nature. He is also a full bucket because he is God. But interestingly, again, if I can use the name Jonathan Edwards pointed out, that as man, Jesus isn't necessarily a full bucket. He has the ability to have his blessedness increased or decreased. I mean, it's his human nature that actually benefits from the work that he did. Remember that, that he humbled himself even to the point of becoming a curse on the cross. That's as low as anybody could possibly go. I think we saw that this morning, didn't we, with regard to his example of humiliation. Not only did God become a man, not ceasing to be God, of course, but he was born in a low estate. That's one thing we didn't look at. He didn't come as a king, but he came as a carpenter's son, and he had to work, had to do manual labor for a living. But in his ministry, he actually lowered himself to the point of being cursed, having our sins imputed to him, and being nailed to a tree, as the Bible says, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Jesus was, you know, well, went as far down in his humiliation as he possibly could go. But did that change? It certainly did change. Because of his humiliation, the Lord exalted him and gave him the name above every name. The Lord gave him glory and honor and praise and worship. These are things which in his humiliation were not there, but now he has received, now that he's been exalted to the right hand of God. The Lord actually, and, and this is, um, again, think about this for a moment, because if God is a full bucket, that means that nothing that you and I can do in any way can make him any happier or sadder, because he's always perfectly blessed. But that isn't true with regard to Jesus. The things we do can make him happier, or sadder, because, again, he is fully man as well as fully God. As God, he couldn't be any happier, but as man, he can be, which means it is important with regard to our Lord Jesus when he sees what we're doing, that we do those things that are honoring to him, because he really is happier when he sees his children walking in the truth and grieves when he sees them not. So again, with regard to God, he has everything he needs in himself. He's perfectly blessed. He's perfectly happy. Our Lord Jesus Christ, in his human nature, that varies with regard to that. It can increase or decrease. But getting back to God, of course, God has everything he needs. Now, why is that a reason that you should love God more? Well, the answer is because the Lord is infinite and doesn't depend on anyone or anything for his survival, for his happiness, or for his existence, 
He's perfectly able to do everything that he has promised you from now to the very end of time. Paul goes on to say in our text, he himself gives to all people life and breath and all things. Now, if God depended on something else for his existence, for his survival, then if that particular thing he depended on failed, then he would fail. If his existence depended on something else, then if it ceased to exist or if it stopped upholding him, then he would cease to exist, which means that everything that God had planned and everything that he had promised would ultimately fail. And you couldn't even be certain that your existence would continue from day to day. As soon as God ceased, you would cease with him, as well as everything else that he has created. But God doesn't depend on anything which means that he can't cease to exist, which means that you will never cease to exist, and that all his plans and his promises to you cannot fail. The Lord, as he has said in his word, is ready and willing to help you in this life, and that help is not going to fail. When the Lord says, if you seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, that he will provide everything that you need, everything, well, food, shelter, clothing, everything that you need, that promise will not fail. When God says that he will work all things together for your good and for the good of his church, that promise cannot fail because God cannot fail. When the Lord says that he will sustain the work of his Holy Spirit in your heart so that you will continue to love him, then you will always love him and you will always serve him because God cannot fail. The Lord will keep you to the end of your days on earth. And when your life is over, he will be there to receive you into heaven. To perfect and to glorify you as he promised that he would. He will be there to acquit you on the day of judgment. Remember, after we die, we do, our souls go to be with the Lord in heaven. But our bodies wait to be resurrected on that final day when Jesus returns. When that happens, we'll stand before him. But God, because... He always lives, will be there to acquit you on that day. And he will receive you into the new heavens and the new earth. And he will continue to bless you throughout eternity as one age turns into another. He will never fail. Now you need to realize because you are dependent, because I am dependent, that your future depends not only on the integrity of God, on his character, that God never lies and God never will lie, but also on the integrity of his being. You know, God, not only does God's morality not change, but his being doesn't change. It cannot change. He always lives to love and to care for you. And he is the only one who does. He is the only one who will not fail you, which is why, of course, we've already read in this psalm, don't put your trust in, in princes in mortal men whose spirit departs and, and he returns to the dust. I mean, he's absolutely dependent on God. Don't trust him, but put your trust in the Lord because God will never fail. He cannot fail. Now again, can you love a God like this? And do you love him? The fact that God always lives is why the wicked fear the Lord. If there was some hope that the fires of hell that they're experiencing even now might eventually be extinguished because God would cease to be, then there would be some hope that their sufferings would not continue into eternity, but they would end someday. But the fact that God never ceases to exist means that his wrath will never cease and the fires will never go out. Now, if you haven't trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior this evening, I can't think of a better reason to trust him than this, that you will be saved from his wrath if you put your trust in him. But, of course, the other reason is simply this, that if you do trust him, he will bless you. He will care for you, not only in this life, but throughout all eternity. As a matter of fact, he's doing that now. And you need to thank him for it by doing what he commands you to do which is to repent and trust in Jesus Christ. But if you trust him, he will never fail you. 
And if you know him this evening, this is simply another reason why you should love him. Because he will always be there to bless you. So I hope that you can see, again, that this is just another piece in the puzzle of why it is you ought to love the Lord. Because he is worthy of your love. He, is, he has all power to do everything. And he has everything that he needs to fulfill all of his promises to you. And he even has the moral character to carry that through. God's not going to promise something and then change his mind and do something else. The Lord is faithful and he never lies. And so may the Lord give you and may he give me as well the grace to see that and to love him with all your heart and your mind and your soul and strength. And if you don't love him, may the Lord grant you his spirit so that you will love him and trust him and experience these blessings for yourself. Let's bow in a moment of prayer and, and let's again thank the Lord that he is as he is and thank him for all the mercies that he's promised to give us and the fact that he will always live to follow through on those promises.